Hey, welcome to our Bible study here at Influence Church. We have just completed the book of Exodus, and now we're moving into the book of Leviticus, the third book in the Bible. We started off this year with Genesis, then we moved into Exodus, and here we are today in the book of Leviticus. In today's study, we're going to do an overview. We're going to look at some significant themes, and I know what you're thinking, right? Leviticus, oh man, that's boring. Um, you probably never read it before. Maybe you did skip through a lot of it. But I want to tell you, at least for this moment, at least once, let's get this book covered. So stay with me, read it through at home as well. And it's really important to understand the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, even though it might seem um, difficult to read because it builds a foundation for what Christ would fulfill. And the more we understand the foundation of our faith, the history of where the world has come from in terms of where we used to be and now where we are, the old covenant, the new covenant, how we offered um, sacrifices to what Jesus fulfilled as the ultimate sacrifice. The more we have a holistic understanding, I believe is the more personal our relationship with God with, will, with God God will be. We will draw closer to God. We will understand the heart of God. We will have more gratitude for what Jesus did for us on the cross so that we are now no longer under these Levitical laws that used to be in the Old Testament and before Christ came. So grab your notepad to take some notes, grab your Bible to follow along as we get into this study. If you have not done it as yet, hit that subscribe button, hit that share button. If you missed any of our previous studies, you can go to our YouTube channel, you can click under the videos tab, and you can rewatch any of our previous studies. So today we are studying the book of Leviticus, and this is going to be an introduction. Now, Leviticus means of the Levites in the Latin, right? So now you're thinking, well, okay, if this book means of the Levites, what is a Levite or who is a Levite? And who, what is this book about, right? Um, this book is a handbook for the priests, the Levites, outlining their duties in worship, and a guidebook for holy living for the Hebrews. So it was a guidebook in terms of worship, how worship should be done for the priests and the Levites, and it was a guidebook for the Hebrews on what holy living would look like. So who is a Levite, right? Levites are members of the tribe of Levi. Now, Levi is one of the 12 sons of Jacob, forming the 12 tribes of Israel. And they provided this specific tribe, the tribe of Levi, that um, lineage, they provided assistance to the priests in the worship in the Jewish temple, all right? So the author of this book is, again, just like Exodus and just like Genesis, the author of this book is Moses because Moses is believed to write majority of the Torah or the Septuagint, the first five books of the Bible, Exodus, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all right? And the date, approximate date that scholars have put this book to be written, it was between 1450 to 1410 BC. So it's a very long time ago. Um, the original audience were the people of Israel, and it was written somewhere in the wilderness close to the Sinai Peninsula. So I've told you guys before that understanding who wrote a book, who it was written to, is very important in understanding the context of what this passage means, right? So we understand that Leviticus, it was originally written to the people of Israel. Um, that means some of it would be transferable to us in this time. Some of it may not be transferable because it was written to that specific audience for that specific time, all right? And understanding that as well helps us to not take our culture, our understanding of how our world operates in this modern culture and, and then impose it onto what we read. Because if we do that, then we'll completely misunderstand what, this, what the book is saying, what the passage is saying. So now that we know the audience, we know the author, we understand that it is speaking about a time way before us, um, a different culture, a different, um, different social status, even different experiences altogether. Different major events would have happened to this group of people. And it's speaking to a specific group of people, all right? So we're going to jump in now to an outline of the book of Leviticus. And the book of Leviticus can be broken up into two main parts. The first part is worshiping a holy God. So from chapter 1 to chapter 17, roughly around there, chapter 1 to chapter 17, the book of Leviticus gives us instructions on how to worship a holy God. Now, in our modern culture, we understand worship to be where we um, live a lifestyle that is pleasing unto God, that is honorable unto God. Uh, we even express worship through um, lifting our hands in praise and song. We express worship through 
giving, we express worship through um, prayer, we express worship in different ways, but our lifestyle honors God, right? Just as in the book of Leviticus, we see outlines for worshiping our holy God, much similar to how we would worship God in our modern culture, but they had more guidance in terms of instructions and law that they had to follow. Now, they were under law and we are under the covenant of grace. Now, the principle of worshiping God, the principle of worshiping God has remained the same. While the practices have changed, the principle has remained the same. So it's very understand, un, it's very important to understand the principles at play when it comes to um, worshiping a holy God. And we'll see that through chapters 1 through chapter 17, right? And these chapters can be broken up into four main parts. Number one is instructions for offerings, right? How do you get, make an offering? What type of offering you need to offer for what type of event or what type of offense? Then we see instructions for the priests, how the priests should worship God, what they had to do as sacrifices, what they had to do in terms of um, festivals, in terms of feasts, in terms of different ceremonies in the temple. Then we see instructions for the people. Again, the festivals that they would have to do, the offerings and sacrifices that the people would have to make in worship unto God. And then we see instructions for the altar, right? How altar processions were to be and what is to be laid on the altar, what type of sacrifices can be made on the altar, who can make a sacrifice at the altar, right? The second half of the book of Leviticus now, um, this is from chapters 18 through chapter 27, talks about living a holy life. So the second half um, is a lot more applicable as well in in our modern culture, these skills are directly transferable when it comes to living a holy life, what honors God, right? So it speaks about standards for the people, rules for the priests, seasons and festivals, and receiving God's blessings. So this is the, how the latter half of um, the book of Leviticus from chapters 18 to 27, which talks about living a holy life. This is how it's broken up, right? Standards for the holy for holy. Um, standards for people, rules for the priests, and seasons and festivals, receiving God's blessings. Now, you will see that some of, this, some of the seasons, some of the festivals, some of it are things that we no longer um, practice. And again, the principle is there in terms of us making sure to honor God. So it has, it has changed in how we do things a little bit, but it is directly transferable. So living a holy life. So I'm really excited to journey through the book of Leviticus. Like I said, I know it might be, it might come across as a little bit difficult to read, but I'm going to help you to simplify, to understand it, and to find the um, application now to your life and to our current modern day um, Christianity as compared to the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus where we had the Old Covenant, all right? So some of the mega themes, right? This is how the book of Leviticus is broken up in terms of the themes that we'll see. The first theme that we start off with is sacrifice and offering, and we are going to be talking a little bit more about sacrifice and offering today, according to the book of Leviticus. Um, the second major theme we see is worship. Then we see health, right, where it speaks about um, lifestyle in terms of eating, in terms of certain practices, in terms of cleanliness, and really good stuff that we want to look into. Um, then we see holiness, and then we see actual instructions to the Levites. Remember, we spoke about the Levites. These are the guys who help out in priestly duties in the temple, and they are from the tribe of Levi. So today we're going to get into the offerings, right? the offerings that were made, and we are covering chapters 1 through 5 today, the first five chapters of the book of Leviticus, and you can read through these five chapters and you'll get more details on the type of offering, um, what type of animal had to use, how it had to be um, sacrificed, the specific place that the priest had to be, how he had to hold the animal, where he had to cut in the animal, what parts of the animal had to be burnt, what parts was, was given as a food offering. So, you can get those more those details as you read through chapters one through five. Um, I'm going to do an overview and help you understand what the offering was, why you had to make that offering, and then how Christ now in the New Testament has fulfilled that offering. Because obviously um, you 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 are reading these offerings and you're not going now to practice these offerings, right? These sacrifices of animals, because Christ has been that ultimate sacrifice for us. So uh, it it is important to understand that because sometimes. As a new believer, you may read the books of Leviticus and you may see these instructions and you might be confused, okay, do I have to do this? Um, is this what, what the practices that are needed, right? Because some other religions do practice um, burned offerings and sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins. Um, is this something that we have to practice? And if we are not practicing it anymore, then why are we not practicing it, right? And we're going to understand that today as we examine these five types of offerings that are see 
seen in chapters one through five. So the first one is a burnt offering. So you can take note of it, a burnt offering, and it's found in Leviticus chapter one. Now, the burnt offering is voluntary. You can choose to do a burnt offering whenever you like. It's not compulsory in any way. And this burnt offering was to make payment for sins in general, right? So this was just generally for the forgiveness of sins. So usually once for the year on the day of atonement, they would offer a burnt offering for all the sins throughout the year. And this was a general burning of, um, this was a general offering of, of an animal that was given up for forgiveness of sins, right? So they would use an animal, whether it's a ram or a goat or a lamb, they would actually use an animal and sacrifice that animal as an offering unto God for forgiveness of sin. The significance of it is it showed a per person's devotion to God. Now, how, does, how, how now has this been fulfilled in Jesus Christ? Why do we no longer do burnt offerings? Well, Christ's death was the perfect offering, right? When Jesus went to the cross, he paid the full price. He was that burnt offering on the cross for the forgiveness of our past, present, and future sins. All our sins for all of humanity, he paid that on the cross, right? So we no longer offer burnt offerings because Jesus was at one and final, at one time sacrifice on the cross for us, right? The second type of offering that we see is grain offering. This is in Leviticus chapter 2, and grain offering is voluntary. Now, as you could expect or in, um, probably infer from the title of this offering, the type of offering, grain offering, grain offering was not an uh, animal that was sacrificed. Grain offering was, used, was either flour that was used, the grain that was used, uh, and that was given as an offering unto God. And there was a way that they had to do it. They had to mix it with oil, and then they had to give this offering, this grain offering, right? And the purpose of this grain offering is to show honor and respect to God in worship. So of their grain, of their crop, they would now give a grain offering. Often, often the, the, the modern day references how out of our finances, out of our earning, our income, we will give an offering to God by placing it in church um, in, our, in those collections that are done through worship unto God in offering, right? So at our church, I strongly believe that giving is an act of worship. And we see this here even from the Old Testament and under the, um, in the book of Leviticus, under the law, that the grain offering was an act of worship to show honor and respect unto God, right? In worship. I believe that when you can trust God in your finances, when you can worship him in your finances, as in you can give to God financially out of a heart of generosity and a heart of love unto God, that is one of the highest forms of, of highest acts of worship unto God, right? So, this is very significant because it acknowledged that we have belongings. We, be, we have, that all that we have belongs to God, right? This is what the grain offering sacrifice. All that we have belongs to God. Like I said, the practice is different now, but the principle has remained the same. The principle is that we should give unto God so that we acknowledge in our mind and in our heart, hey, all that I have, it belongs to God. I, this job that I have, it is because of God. The finances that I have is because of God. The house that I have is because of God. He's the one that gives me the strength. He's the one that owns everything in this world. I am just a steward of everything that exists in this world. He created all things. All things were made by him and through him. He owned all things, right? So when I, when I say my money, it's not, necess, it, it's not I didn't make this money. It's not, it's not my belongings, but it's God that has made the money. If you're saying, well, God didn't manufacture the dollars, right? He made the trees that are used as a product to manufacture these bills. So it, it is all God's belongings that he has entrusted into humanity when he created Adam and Eve. He gave them the earth and he said, this is yours to dwell in, to be fruitful and to multiply, right? It is given to us to steward, to use, to be to be faithful servants of what God has given us, right? And that mentality of mine, this is mine, this belongs to me, I somehow have earned it, is a selfish mentality that takes us away from having our minds set in a place where we acknowledge that all that we have belongs unto God. And because we, we understand that, we honor God in giving unto him as a way of showing that we acknowledge that and we worship God because he's the one that gives it to us, right? So it's more of an acknowledgement. It's more of a worship than necessarily God needs your green, right? God needs your money. That's not what it is. It's more of a you acknowledging from your heart, you having your heart in that right place to say, I'm going to give because I understand that God has been the one that has given me all that I have, right? Now, how, how has this been fulfilled? Christ was the perfect man who gave all of himself to God and others. So he demonstrated to us what it meant to give. All that, God, all that Jesus was, everything that he did on the 
on the face of the earth, all of his life, all of his ministry was always about giving, right? He gave of, of, of himself by laying down his, his life on the cross. He gave up his life for humanity. He gave up all that he had. He gave, he, he, he had no earthly riches and wealth. He would feed those that, that listened to his sermons, that were, that were seated in the crowds. He would feed them. He would provide for them. He would, he would turn water into wine to ensure that their needs are met. He would do miracles for them. He gave all to them in service, in love, in worship. He gave all that he could to humanity. He gave all to us, all right? So this is a grain offering. The third one we have here is the peace offering. The peace offering, again, is voluntary and is found in Leviticus chapter 3. And the peace offering is to express gratitude to God. It symbolized peace and fellowship with God. So you can think of the peace offering as, as that time that we would spend in prayer with God, that meditation on the word of God, that time, that intimate space with God. So the peace offering was to symbolize peace with God and fellowship with God. As in, there was not no animosity between you and God. You have a relationship with God. Remember now in the Old Testament, um, we, could, we could not go to God face to face because of the fact that Jesus didn't die on the cross for us. And under the Old Testament law, only the high priest could come before God and have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Thank God for Jesus that he separated or tore the veil. And now we can have intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with God because of the righteousness of Christ Jesus that is laid upon us through the sacrifice of what Jesus paid on the cross. Um, so the peace offering is God, is us um, voluntarily, again, just like the first two offerings is voluntary. We are saying now, hey, God, I want to spend time with you. I want to pray. I want to seek your face, right? I want to make sure that we have a close and intimate walk, right? Um, and, the, and Christ, how he perfected this offering is Christ is the only way to fellowship with God. So through Christ Jesus, we can have fellowship with God, right? Through Jesus Christ, we can have that fellowship with God and that intimacy with God. Last two, right? And these last two are required. They are compulsory. Um, number four is sin offering, uh, Leviticus chapter four, and this is as a requirement. And the purpose of this is to make payment for the unintentional sins of uncleanliness, neglect, or thoughtlessness. So the sin offering was for the things that were unintentional. Unintentional sin, uncleanliness, neglect, or thoughtlessness, right? Now, um, the significance of this was to restore the sinner to fellowship with God and showed seriousness of sin. And, it's, uh, and in terms of Jesus Christ, Christ's death restores our fellowship with God. So he became that sin offering on the cross to restore our fellowship, right? So sin is, separates us from God. Christ, who is our Savior, he draws us closer and he, um, he restores us to God regardless of our sins, um, unintentional, those that are of neglect, those are of thoughtlessness. So no longer do you have to make a sin offering, although I know a lot of the men continue to make sin offerings for their thought thoughtlessness to their wives at times. Okay, that was a really lame joke, all right? Um, but yeah, this was the sin offering, and it was found in Leviticus chapter 4. And then we move to Leviticus chapter 5, which is the last type of offering I want to talk about today. And this is the trespass offering. And this, again, is a requirement. And the trespass offering was to make payment for the sins against God. Look at this, but not only God, but against others. A sacrifice was made to God, and the injured person was repaid or compensated, right? So you had to make a, sac a sacrifice to God. And then the person that you trespass, the person that you hurt, the person that you did wrong to, stole from whatever it may be, you had to return to them, compensate them for what wrong you did to them, right? Um, and this, the significance of this was it provided compensation for injured parties. And Christ's debt takes away the deadly consequences of sin. So, um, so in the Old Testament, this sin offering for the trespasses, for what they did wrong unto God, um, this, would, this would cover them or keep them from not being repaid by God for their sins. So they would not be punished, in other words, for their sins because of their sin offering, right? When Christ died on the cross, all the consequences of our sins was laid upon him. He took on the full payment on pain of the cross for all our sins, right? The full punishment was laid upon him so that we don't have to face that punishment anymore all right we don't have to face that punishment uh what i think is very important to take away from this is while we ought to repent of our sins while we ought to um 
make sure and ask God for forgiveness as Jesus will teach us in the model prayer to pray our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He would say, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? I think I probably mixed up something there, but the point is that he would have taught us to pray to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? And it's important for us to pray that prayer unto God, but also just as in the Old Testament, that when we have offended people, that we, through, um, through an offering, that we make things right with those people, whether it is that we actually confess and we, we repent of our sins to the person that we've hurt, we say, I apologize for what I've done, or if we've actually wronged them, if we've borrowed money or whatever it may be, um, we owe people for something, or we probably um, got in an accident and damaged someone's vehicle, um, damaged someone's property with maybe our animals, our pets damaged someone else's property, whatever it may be, our children probably damaged someone else's property. We ought to repay them, the injured parties, for, um, for us trespassing against us, for what we've done to injure this person, right? We ought to repay them and comp compensate them for what they have lost. That is the heart of Christ. That is the heart of God we see from even in the Old Testament and even till now, that is still the heart of Christ, right? Christ would say to forgive those as as He as you have been forgiven, right? So just as much as you have been forgiven, you should forgive 70 times seven, right? You should forgive a, a, an amount that is un, 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 uh, that you are unable to keep a track or a record of how many times you've forgiven people, right? Just as Christ has forgiven, so too we should forgive others and we should repay our debts um, we should repay the injured or incurred incurments that we've made unto other people by our trespasses, right? So these are the five offerings. As you would see, they are very important in us understanding the heart of God and the principles are transferable into our modern day Christianity. Christ has fulfilled the offerings and fulfilled the sacrifices. Uh, we still have a role to play in how we worship God, in how we honor God, in how we um, treat people, how we love people, how we um, repay people when we've wronged them as well. And I believe these principles are very, very important to help us in our journey with Christ, in our growth and in our development. So that's the end of today's study. Um, next week, we continue in the book of Leviticus. Uh, we won't be spending much time in this book as we've broken it up into different sessions. Um, I would say roughly between four to five sessions as compared to our um, 10 to 15 sessions or so in our last two studies of Genesis and Exodus. So you got to read quickly so that you don't get left behind in this study. If you have questions, you can leave it in the comments. If you have criticism as well, you can do that. If you have not done it as yet, hit that share button, hit that subscribe button. If you're viewing it at day, enjoy the rest of your day at night, enjoy the rest of your night, and God richly bless you.